All right, the camera is rolling. Hey, and welcome back to my channel. I'm Matt, the printing nerd, and today I want to give you a brief overview about the 3D printer I've created that I call the 100. It does speedboats in less than six minutes and is capable of doing high quality prints in one tenth of the time a Ender 3 would need. By the time recording, the 100 is at the 26th rank of the leaderboard of the fastest printers in the world. And it's the fastest one that uses a 3D printed frame. And the best thing, this printer is 100% open source. Which means, if you like this printer and you would like to build one by your own, you find all the resources needed to do this in the video description. In the next couple of minutes, I'll give you a brief overview on the printer. But before we go into detail, let's talk a bit about the decisions I've made to make this project happen. So about six months ago, the YouTube algorithm showed me a video of this guy that builds 3D printers that were mostly 3D printed. Big shout out to Rolo Hahn and his Rook printer that inspired me in the first place. By the time I watched that video, I felt caught. Since I built many 3D printers before, but the one question I've asked myself was, should I use 1515 aluminum profiles or should I use 2020 profiles? But I never asked myself if aluminum profiles itself were the best choice. So I built my own Rook and started optimizing it while measuring the performance. Well, the results were mediocre at best. While I was able to get the printer running at a decent quality, there was a limit at acceleration. At about 5000 mm per square second, the frame of the printer starts shaking which made speedboat printing impossible. Here is an attempt of doing a 3D Benchy at a speed of 200 mm per second at an acceleration of 8000 mm per square second. As you can see, the frame is shaking. To its credit, the print finished in about 22 minutes, but the printer also moved about 6 cm in the process of making. At that point I knew that the Rook was not meant for fast speed printing as the creator of it always says, it's a printer to introduce people into construction of 3D printers while printing at a much better quality that most of the bed slingers out there are capable of. But this experiment made me curious. Is it even possible to go fast on a printed frame? And where would be the limits of such a printer? I've built a couple of very fast printers in the past. Multiple V0s, VZbots and Retrix. By doing this, I've learned a lot about the process of tuning and optimizing that printers to be able to print speedboats in under 10 minutes. I felt really confident in designing a printer on my own that is focused on fast printing. So I gave myself a crazy goal. I wanted to create a printer that is capable of doing 100,000 millimeters per square seconds acceleration on a printed frame. When we look at the top 5 of the fastest recorded speed print attempts, they have one thing in common. 4 of the 5 speedboats were printed on an enhanced Voron V0. With its small print bed, it's made for fast printing. For me, the V0 is an absolute monster in its speed spot. But, in my opinion, this sweet spot is also its biggest weakness. When I built my first V0, I built it, tuned it, printed a couple of speedboats and then it got dusty. After a couple of months I decided to sell it because I felt bad having such a fast machine not printing on it. So I analyzed my print history and the data matched my belly feeling. Only 17% of all the items I've printed could be printed on the small V0 print bed. I did some more research and found out that 72% of my prints could be done on a 165 by 165 big print bed. For me, this seems to be the sweet spot between versatility and speed. When changing to a much bigger print bed, we have to be smart on the construction side to get as much speed as possible out of the printer. Therefore, I've introduced the white square and built the printer around it. The white square is the area that's the center of gravity for the printer. Every component of this printer was placed at a spot where it helps to keep the center of gravity in this area. For example, let's have a look at the placement of the motors. If you measure the distance of the A and B motor compared to the C motors, you will notice 
that they meet at the point that's in the white square. Another thing that helps to keep the center of gravity at the white square is the shape and the weight distribution of the print bed. If you take a closer look under the print bed, you will see that the front part of it is hollow while the back part is solid to get as much weight as possible at the area of the white square without losing its own center of gravity at the lead screws. This is important to have a smooth z-axis without binding. With the experience I've made with my Rook, I was sure that having a heavy frame construction is key for fast printing on the 100. Therefore, every part of this printer should be attached to the frame and every part that is not moving should be as heavy as possible. For example, the power supply. It's slightly oversized for this printer, but therefore it weighs more and is much cheaper than a smaller alternative. And not only that, if you take a closer look at the positioning of the power supply, you will notice that it's aligned to the white square to improve stability of the construction even more. Besides that, the motherboard, the extruder and all the cables are attached to the frame. Especially for the cables, I've built a small cable box that does not only do the cable management, but it also keeps the weight of the cables on the frame, which is not much, but at this level every gram counts. Looking at the past of the project, this was the most important principle I've introduced at the beginning. Changing parts of the printer without affecting other parts and therefore recalibrating them was the key that helped me keep going on. Building printers is tough. There is a time constructors call integration hell where one problem creates another one. It feels like going down a rabbit hole for days without seeing the project going in the right direction. Being able to decouple parts of the printer so that they don't affect each other makes this painful phase much shorter. Having a construction that supports you is the key to keep you motivated, especially when you are in the tuning phase where shaping a second of your next speedboat means multiple attempts that cost you multiple tuning steps on your construction. When it comes to fast printing, there are three areas in which a printer should be able to reach a decent performance. Starting first, the motion system. Moving the tool head fast is crucial for a high speed printer. The gantry of the 100 is based on an 8mm linear rod motion system. It's able to move the tool head at a speed of 400 mm per second with an acceleration of 100,000 mm per second squared. To do this, the 100 uses normal NEMA 17 stepper motors of a length of 40 mm. A self printed frame offers great advantages over aluminium profiles, since it's possible to move the AB motors and the belt fasteners into the frame. This allows us to keep the belt paths as short as possible without reducing the printing area. Another factor for fast printing is being able to melt filament fast. A normal V6 hot end taps out at about 15 to 20 cubic millimeters volumetric flow, which limits the print speed of a speedboat to about 25 minutes at best. For the 100, I've chose a CHC Pro Volcano hot end with a Volcano extender and a CHT clone nozzle. With this setup, the hot end is able to melt 43 cubic millimeters of PLA at a temperature of 240 degrees Celsius without skipping. The last big factor for fast printing is cooling. The ability to quickly cool the filament helps keep it in place during steep changes in direction. Also, being able to control the hot end's temperature helps to reduce heat creep and is important to avoid clogging the nozzle during printing. Here a big shout out to Gulzifer. Inspired by his rookery, I was able to design a tool head that is only 48 mm wide while integrating two 5015 part cooling fans and one 4010 hot end fan. The tool head is optimized for maximum airflow within an area of 2x2 two two cm. With this cooling system, the 100 is capable of printing overhangs of 80 degrees at a fan speed of 50%. Here's a demonstration of the cooling system at various fan speed levels. Let the footage speak for itself.
Even if it's not a big factor for fast printing, I wanted to create a printer that can be flexibly expanded. Therefore, I've designed this easy to customize frame connections that could be replaced by different types of mounts for various scenarios. For example, if you plan to print ABS on this printer, it would be nice to have a housing around it. The printer was designed cubic, so you could easily add four sheets of acrylic glass around it and attach them through custom holders that you've designed for this. Another scenario would be cooling. Maybe you want to go even faster and decide to not use my tool head and replace it by an even lighter variant. To do this, you could design two custom fan ducts made for 120 part cooling fans and attach them to the front and the back of the frame. Or maybe you want to attach a webcam or a display onto the printer. There is plenty of space for them at the top or bottom front for a display or at the sides for a webcam. I'm excited to see what kind of modifications the community will develop for this printer in the next few weeks. We will certainly record a stream where I take a look at the best add-ons for this printer and rate them together with you. Next up, let's have a look at a couple of prints made with the 100. The printer comes with three slicer profiles that fit three purposes. First, the quality one. Here, the goal was to create as fast as possible profile that does not compromise on quality. It's a mix of very fast infills with moderate perimeters that use resonance compensation and pressure advance to get nice mostly artifact free surfaces at a high speed. The second profile is focused on functional performance. It's meant for rapid prototyping. While not being as smooth and as shiny as the quality profile, parts made with this profile are fully functional without any major issues. The last profile is based on the speedboat race rules with many optimizations and is meant for maximum speed print attempts. It aims to print a blob of plastic that contours reminds you of a 3D banshee while stretching the rules of the speedboat race to its maximum. It's mainly used to test the printer's performance, so if you want to melt plastic fast while looking cool, this is your profile. By the way, this Benchy was printed with my speedboat profile and finished at 5 minutes and 50 seconds. This was also the boat that was produced on my speedboat race attempt that got approved on the 20th 6 rank on the speedboat leaderboard. If you want to see the whole attempt, there is a link to it in the info card. Here is the figure of a genie in a bottle that was printed with the quality profile. Have a look at those smooth surfaces especially in the lower part of the print where steep overhangs meet smooth curves. At this part, most printers with weaker cooling systems struggle to keep the filament on spot. The upper body is a good testing area for vibration artifacts that occur in the reflection on printers where the construction is not able to hold up the high speed defined in the profile. Another critical area are the hands and the head. Have a look at those small holes in the earrings and the small gaps between the teeth and the chin. Most high flow hot ends struggle with overflow, blobbing and stringing on such small details and ruin the print. Overall, I think the 100 does a decent job on quality printing, especially if you keep in mind that its main purpose was to do this as fast as possible. The print of the Genie took less than two hours. The parameter was printed at 160 millimeters per second the infill reached flow rates at about 30 cubic millimeters volumetric flow. The next sample is a figure of Anubis. It was printed with a functional profile. As you can see, the face has a couple of blobs and the resolution of the details is not as high as in the first example. There is also a bit of stringing. Normally I would clean up those smaller issues, but for me it was important to show you the raw performance of the printer. You also might see small vibration artifacts on the body. It's not that bad considering that the outer perimeter was printed at 240 mm per second. I really like how it came out, especially when considering the time it took to print. It took me 33 minutes to print. For comparison, the same print would take 7 hours and 23 minutes on a stock Ender 3. Next, we have a map of my hometown. I've printed this with the quality profile as a stringing test. As you can see, there are no stringing lines or blob artifacts on the contours of the print. Also, let's have a look at the first layer. 
It's perfectly smooth with no signs of warping at all. Next up we have the bug. It's printed as one part with the quality profile. Here it's important to be able to print fine joints that have a good layer adhesion so that the construction can be flexible while not ripping apart. Another functional part I've printed is the tool head of the 100 itself. Here you can see much sharper vibration artifacts than on the print of the Anubis figure. These artifacts are caused by fast direction changes the printer has to make while printing the tool head. Also, there is a bit of blobbing that you can feel when rubbing over it. So, it's not pretty, but a perfectly fine functional part. And last but not least, the final boss. Here I wanted to test the whole printer package. Extreme tough first layers combined with very steep overhangs at the chin section that tend to warp. Multiple fine details, overhangs and the printing part that takes almost the whole printing area of the 100. The T800 took me 7 hours and 58 minutes to print. For reference, a stock Ender 3 would need more than 83 hours to finish this task, which is more than 10 times slower than on the 100. Not bad for a DIY printer, huh? If you like this printer and would like to build one by yourself, have a look at the video description. There you will find the bill of material and all the STL files that you need to print a 100 by yourself. Currently there is no step-by-step -step construction plan for building this printer. In the near future I plan to build a second 100 here on stream together with the community. So if you like to participate, subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to be reminded when I'm streaming. If you want to support this project, and get in touch with me, you might consider a subscription at Patreon. There, I write a development diary for the 100 at a daily basis. So, if you like to get access to unreleased beta parts and want help me by testing them and giving feedback, I would appreciate a subscription at Patreon. Another way to support this project would be to hit the like button and comment on this video to help me be visible on the YouTube algorithm for suggesting this video to other people. So that's it for today, stay tuned for more content and now get out of here.